Here they come. Happy Friday. All right, Jeff, has everyone uh, been let in? We have about 60 people on the line, so that's great. They're all admitted, and I'll keep admitting them as they come. Excellent, thank you. Well, happy Friday, everyone. Uh, we are happy to host you today and greet you. Uh, thank you for being here over the three, what's gonna be a three-day weekend. Uh, my name is Mary Mendoza Newman, and I am one of the board members, vice chair. I'm also a training director at Stanford University Counseling and Psych Services. Super excited today to have some colleagues present to you. Um, let me share my screen. Let me find my screen. I think it's this one, yes. Okay. All right. So just wanted to, um, again, welcome you to uh, today's program, which is uh, Shifting Gears, Adapting Training Programs in a New Era of Mental Health Care with our colleagues, Kenley, Jason, and Jenna. And let me move this out of the way. All right. So just to review some Zoom etiquette, this is a meeting. So right now, everyone is muted. You will have to unmute yourself um, when or if you choose to um, ask a question. Uh, please do use speaker view. There's an, an, uh, probably close to 70 plus people that will be here today. And that way, you'll be able to see who is speaking. Um, to view any captions, you can click on the Zoom cl closed caption. Um, oh, those, that was a link to the instructions. My apologies. I didn't update that. I don't think you can actually click on that. Um, but I'll, I'll send them to you through the chat. Um, also, we do encourage you to use the chat box for questions and comments today. We will be moderating and keeping track of that, um, but we will save some Q&A at the end. So um, maybe about 10 minutes or so, and you again can use the chat, or if you choose to speak, don't forget to unmute yourself. And please know that the webinar is being recorded. And so it will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, reminder that if you've registered and you're here, you will receive an email to complete the evaluation to receive CE credit. And any presentation handouts, um, again, will be sent out uh, to all of the folks who have registered and be made available on the website. Um, again, um, sorry, Shona, I didn't add you in here. Um, just some last minute changes, but Shona, um, our uh, secretary, right. APIC board secretary will be available to moderate as well. And uh, these are the objectives. Oh, pardon me. Okay, I did a really bad job of um, updating my slides, but um, the learning objectives are correct. The title is from last webinar, so my apologies for that. Uh, but I didn't get this wrong, and those are our, our speakers. Uh, we are really delighted to welcome again, Kenley, Jenna, and Jason. And with that, I don't wanna take any more of your time, and thank you for being here to present to us today. Thank you, Mary. I am going to go ahead and share my screen, y'all, so you can see our presentation. <clears throat> can everybody see that okay? Awesome. Well, um, I am Kenley Yurdy. As Mary said, I am the Director of Clinical Training at Ginger, which is actually a nationwide telebehavioral health provider. And um, I made this transition from the University of Colorado Boulder Counseling and Psychiatric Services, where I was the training director um, prior to taking on this role. So I'm going to let my colleagues introduce themselves really quickly before we dive into our content. I am Jenna Glover, and I am the director of training at Children's Hospital Colorado. Um, thanks for showing up on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Hi, y'all. I'm, I'm Jason Hindman, and I'm the training director at Texas A&M University uh, Counseling and Psychological Services. All right. Well, thanks for being here, like just Jason and Jenna said. Um, Mary went over our learning objectives, so 
Um, I won't go into these in too great a detail, but I will kind of put the caveat out there that we initially proposed this presentation before the pandemic happened. And so it was quite timely when we were asked to, you know, do this in webinar format. So it's shifted a little bit in that we've added content because so much has changed in the world of training in the past year and the world mm -hmm. itself in the past year. And so um, we have some new stuff that we're going to speak to that has shifted and then also kind of the original content we had planned back when this was supposed to be presented in 2020. Okay. It's me, right? It's you, Jason. Yeah, Take it right. Away. So <laughs> so yeah, I, I work at a university counseling center and I've been in this profession now for uh, 12 years. And when I think back to my first uh, days at Texas A&M's counseling center, it's uh, pretty remarkable how much has changed. Um, back then, uh, we traditionally operated with uh, no session limits and no wait list. Uh, and for years, the default was individual therapy. And I imagine some of you on the screen can relate to that. Um, and suffice it to say, it's not quite like that anymore. Um, we now do so much with groups and workshops, and we emphasize outreach interventions to meet students where they're at. Uh, we even use some single session interventions. And uh, it, it, it hasn't been an easy transition for everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if, if I, as a fairly uh, early career professional, have felt some of this press, how much more of a struggle has it been for folks that have been in the field for, for much longer and have had uh, decades to get established in certain ways of doing things? So, um, you know, many of these folks are supervisors who are overseeing service delivery activities that, uh, that are, are new to them. They're trying to teach them uh, these, these interventions, these, these ways of operating and functioning to trainees while they learn them themselves, while they learn these things themselves. Um, and so um, another factor in this is, is the, the more rigid folks on our staff. Uh, who, who lack the flexibility to do things a little bit differently than they were done previously. And, and so um, one of the problems that we have faced is sort of some resistance or some grumbling about, you know, having to do things differently and not, not, not having those defaults that we used to have. And uh, sometimes the grumbling even falls on the, the listening ear of our trainees, um, which is, is not something we want to happen. So, um, we're really facing a new era, certainly, uh, I mean, I would say just across the, the entire realm of psychology. Uh, we're having to shift scope in a number of different ways to accommodate uh, increased acuity, uh, to accommodate um, limited resources and the a higher demand for, for services. We're, we're uh, facing pressure from various stakeholders, uh, there's shifts with increased integrated care, which you're going to hear us talking about quite a bit today. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, so much has changed over the last year and a half with, with COVID and, um, and, and in the socio-political landscape as well. So we can go to the next slide. After this past year, I find myself uh, wondering if the field of psychology is ever going to be the same. In some ways, that's good, right? We, in some ways, I think we have grown uh, in, in some ways. Uh, telehealth, uh, while there were some early adapters uh, that were doing this before the pandemic, and now nearly everybody in the field of psychology has experience with telehealth. And we've all kind of had the experience, I don't wanna speak for everybody, but uh, so many people I talk to in this profession have had the experience that this is doable. This is, this is uh, I, can, I, can, I can connect with clients in this format and this works. Uh, positive outcomes are occurring, change is happening. People are growing and changing and even in this uh, more vir this virtual format. Now it's, it's required some shifts, no doubt. Uh, there's been some benefits. It, it, it's made therapy more accessible to so many people uh, where it wasn't before. I'm, I'm able to use resources on a screen that maybe I wasn't able to, to, to use before. But it's required a lot of uh, 
uh, shifting around as well. I mean, we've had to rethink, you know, how we approach the consent process and the privacy process. Uh, there's been changes to uh, how we record and store videos for trainees. How do we do that securely? Uh, that, that was one of the biggest challenges for us. Uh, and then what about managing crises? Um, when there's a crisis unfolding and you're doing this through phone or through video conference, uh, what kind of uh, processes or pathways can we build in for trainees to consult in a pinch? So these were some of the challenges that we faced with COVID over the last uh, 15 months or so. Um, and, and those with good, those staff members, those trainers with strong technology skills and a willingness to adapt, and that they had the advantage uh, at our agency. And uh, those with resilience uh, seem to, to, to you know, slide through this process uh, much more naturally. Oh. Now, um, when I think about the, the sort of team building and investment that happened at CAPS over my first decade there at Texas A&M. You know, we did a lot of stuff with self-care and teamwork. And these are common things, I think, any, anytime you work at an organization of people. Um, but I, I think about, you know, the opportunity with our staff to promote things like adaptability uh, and flexibility or an eagerness for ongoing learning? Uh, how do we promote self-efficacy, resilience, openness? And uh, the, the, the good thing is we know how to do that as psychologists. We do this all the time with our clients, right? And so doing this with our staff, with the training teams that we work with is probably going to be so key over the next uh, a uh, few years as the profession just continues to evolve. Um, we're going to get into a lot more of this specifically, but I'm going to I'm going to hand it over to I think Jenna. Thanks, Jason. Um, so, one of the really important things that emerged during this last year was the increased attention on social justice. And, you know, going back a year um, with the murder of George Floyd and the current zeitgeist um, of, of the country really brought this to the forefront. And uh, for the first time in a way that was really different than we've ever seen before, people were having conversations and we were confronting um, systemic racism in a way that just hadn't uh, historically been done. Um, I think because of COVID, um, systemic racism could no longer be ignored. And so looking at like the BIPOC population um, and just the obvious health disparities um, that were that are evident throughout the system really brought this um, into our awareness. And I think the interesting thing about this is that um, for, the, for the first time on a, a large scale level, really white people started engaging in the conversation differently. Now, this is something that's been important to our profession for a long time. And it's been part of our ethics code for a long time. And it's something that we as training directors um, have been committed to for a long time um, and needed to be committed to for a long time. Um, however, the, the level of importance for us to jump on the moment um, and, and go with the current zeitgeist it is such a wonderful opportunity to do something meaningful um, and really our trainees expect it. And so I think we have moved from training, training programs that have been doing cool things with DEI being innovative to that being the expectation. And if you're not doing active things with DEI, it's starting to be viewed as negligent. Um, and, and that's probably an important shift that's happened for our field and for training that we have really woken up um, and sobered up to the importance that we play a vital role in this in training students um, to be aware of these things is so essential. So um, a couple of things that I just wanna highlight. So we really have moved um, as a framework from cultural competency to cultural humility, um, acknowledging that really there is no amount of skills that you can learn that are going to make you culturally competent to interact in any situation. And instead, we wanna really start reframing the language that you're using with students and the framework that we're using with supervisors, that cultural humility is a lifelong learning process. It's about examining your own biases, understanding your own values and beliefs and how those impact the way that you interact with other people, as well as learning about other people's values and beliefs um, and perceptions. So I think that's such an important part of this. 
And um, as we're preparing our trainees for this, we have to acknowledge that our white trainees and our BIPOC trainees have different experiences. <laughs> and we need to call that out and talk about that as we talk about these um, things. And so we're gonna play just a, a quick video clip um, that maybe highlights why this is important to acknowledge this and thinking about those different perspectives. Vast majority of white Americans have really never been in a position to. Is that working? Sounds really low, Kenley. Um, um, I turn, let's see. I'll try it again. If you. What's that? I, I was going to say there's an uh, option to optimize the sound, the screen share. About race. Uh, and racism, and facts, sort of sorry, y'all. I should have practiced this. Um, Shona, where would that be? Um, I, take it up. Can I, take it up? I can you hear can it fine. It. I can hear it fine. Can people see my screen now? I'm, I just optimized mine for playing this. Here, I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Here you go. See. Okay. The vast majority of white Americans have really never been in a position where we had to think actively about race and racism and that sort of happened historically until today of being really oblivious to the lived experiences of people of color. So then when those experiences get brought to our attention, either because people of color talk about them or some of the incident takes place or some study comes out demonstration discrimination, uh, we're usually caught very much off guard. We're sort of in that la-la land of believing that you know, we're sort of in this post-racial place. And unfortunately, it's been that way for a long time. It's not just the modern phenomenon of white folks going back 40 years did not, even in the early 60s, think that racism was really a big deal worth focusing very much attention on. A very small minority of people realized it as much. The vast majority of whites said at that time that people of color had equal opportunity to whiteness. So I think it's difficult because to be white uh, is to be in that sort of bubble of obliviousness where you don't have to think about it. And if you don't have to think about it, you don't get a lot of practice talking about it. And if you don't have a lot of practice talking about it, when you finally have to, you usually don't have the language, you don't have the skills. It's um, it's like having a book club where uh, people of color and white folks have all been asked to read the same book. And in this case, it's the book of their collective life. The people of color have read 400 pages, white folks have read the preface, and then we're supposed to come together and have a conversation about it. So, uh, Kinley, if you want to go back to sharing. Um, I, I really like that video clip, and I apologize for those who couldn't hear it. We can throw a link in there so you can listen to it afterwards. Um, I play this for my trainees and we actually have a conversation about what would it be like if you were in a book club and some of you have read the preface and some of you have read 400 pages and how that discussion might be difficult. Um, and also to have a really meaningful experience. Kenley, we can hear the background of your video playing. You have to forgive us. We've only had a year and a couple of months to learn how to do Zoom, so we're still learning. <laughs> Is it going? Can people hear that? All right. I think it went away. Okay. So anyway, um, I think it's important to acknowledge a conversation and also acknowledging among trainees that it's not enough then to ask people who have read 400 pages to um, give the synopsis of 400 pages to people who have read the preface and that people who have read the preface need to read the book. Um, and so I think it's important to talk about these things and figure out how to have those active conversations, knowing that for many of our white trainees, white supervisors, myself as a white person, um, new to these conversations, um, will make mistakes and need to practice the skills. Um, just a, a couple of things to think about. So we need to move away from just focus on DEI and, and um, not doing racist things to being anti-racist programs. So we are doing things to systematically evaluate our policies and our procedure, uh, procedures through those lenses. Um, the CCTC just sent out an awesome social responsive toolkit. If you don't have it, throw it in the chat, get it. Um, it has such great resources to it. Um, this really needs to be a top down and a bottom up effort in your organization. Um, sometimes it's hard to move an organization. One of the things we found is as we worked on our recruitment practices, we've been able to share that with what's happening in the larger organization and there's been an openness to it. So again, jumping on the zeitgeist. Um, so doing things like creating an anti-racist program statement um, and being able to publicly display those things is helpful. Um, one thing that I think is incredibly important if we're serious about this work is starting to develop 
baseline data. So getting the demographic data of the trainees who are coming in, of the applicants' demographics, um, and finding anonymous ways to survey that. So you can start setting goals for areas where you can improve diversity. And then doing that for your supervisors so you can create targets for how you're actually going to um, increase diversity in a specific area that is of the most need for your program. So those are deliberate things to do. And then finally, thinking about what are some ways that you can engage trainees in these activities. So um, as training directors in Colorado, we're working to pilot a program this year. Um, we're gonna do racial caucusing where um, four times a year, we're gonna bring white trainees together to have a white racial caucus to talk about internalized racial superiority. So white people are responsible for educating themselves on racism. And we're going to have um, a people of color caucus where our trainees can come together and talk about internalized racial suppression and their experiences as people of color moving into training in Colorado. Um, so there are things that we can do again, where we're not just saying, hey, we don't wanna do this, but we're actively gonna talk about it. We're gonna give structures to trainees to do that. Um, and thinking how we really advance this work now that the zeitgeist is on our side and people are open to and expecting this. I think next slide. Thanks, Jenna. I love that uh, top down and bottom up at the same time. Um, you know, as, um, as we continue to talk about kind of this new era of, of psychology training, uh, I oftentimes find myself wondering if we insulate trainees from the, so the, some of the realities of the job. Um, so I know, I know we have people here in all kinds of settings and VAs and, and community mental health clinics and university counseling centers and, and so on. Um, but maybe kind of nod your head on screen. If you've had people come to your training program and after getting a taste of it, decide, whoa, this isn't for me. Uh, anybody, anybody had some of that? Um, uh, this, is, this is often a situation where trainees have been insulated from some of the realities. And then once they, they face some of the realities, uh, they realize this isn't a fit. This isn't for me. But uh, if, if interns come to our programs, I think we owe it to them uh, to, to help them cultivate the skills that are gonna be relevant to them uh, in the 2020s um, so that they can thrive um, in, in, in this profession. And these aren't necessarily the same skills and abilities that we were uh, emphasizing 10 years ago. One of the things that I talk about uh, in my role is the scrappy factor. Uh, some interns come to our training program and they're, they're pretty strong case managers. Others stink, quite frankly. Um, I, you know, I've, I've learned how to be scrappy by kind of getting myself into sticky situations. I imagine you have too. And realizing, whoa, there's got to be a better way to do this. Um, suddenly I have 30 clients and that, that's not good. Um, and, and sometimes it's just a matter of language uh, for being scrappy. Sometimes uh, interns just don't realize that you can say things like, you know, um, at the end of a counseling session, you know, uh, why don't you contact me when you're ready to schedule another meeting? So many times our, our trainees just default to, all right, so you're coming back next week. Um, other times, interns really struggle with the language for how to refer to group and really sell group as a, an excellent intervention, the, the, the ideal intervention, really, for some relational concerns. And so sometimes it's just a matter of language. But I, I can tell who struggles with the scrappy factor by the fact that I'll, I'll, I'll have some interns come to my office and they'll say, I, I literally have no place to put another client. And that's not because we're giving them more, you know, we're treating them, you know, oppressively. It's because they are defaulting to, we're going to do individual therapy with everybody. And that's just not going to work in this era. Uh, some interns, some trainees think more rigidly than others. Uh, others have cognitive flexibility and they're able to think about group and workshop and maybe less frequent treatment and, and we can maybe meet every third week, depending on the situation. Another factor that uh, we emphasize in our training program is holding tension. Um, what needs to be done right now and what can wait for later? And is it okay to wait for later for some things? Uh, listening and thinking rather than responding with immediate answers or decisions. I, I got put in a situation where I had to do this just the other day where I had some press on me to 
um, to have uh, supervision prep time for our training rotations. Of course, we have supervision prep time for our primary supervision, but we also do some sort of auxiliary supervision. And, and, and some of our trainees were saying, we need to, some soup prep time for that also. Then, like an hour later, I'm getting press from our director saying, hey, we need to eliminate some of the gray space. There's just gray space, which for us is, if there's gray space on the calendar, you're not really doing anything. So there's, or there are meetings, you know, meetings, 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 meetings. And, uh, and so we need to eliminate some of the gray space. There's a lot of it. And so these two messages, I'm getting, getting pinched from both sides. It's kind of the trainers are often middle managers. Anybody relate to that? And so we're getting pinched from both sides. And so I think Jason of three years ago might've said, uh, you know, some sort of response and regretted it an hour later. But I, in the last three years, I think I've learned to better hold tension and just say, I'm glad you brought this up. I'm gonna think about that. And uh, that has been such a helpful skill. And I, I think sometimes our, our trainees need to, to learn that skill of, of just sitting in the tension and, and holding uh, an idea. Uh, another thing that we've been uh, emphasizing is shifting gears. So being able to upshift and downshift, accelerate and de decelerate, even in conversations, changing the tone and, and, and being able to slow down. Sometimes it's important to slow down and, and, and ask the next question and then the next question and then the next question. Um, sometimes it's important to be able to ask a trainee, hey, you, you wanna get some fresh air and go for a walk? Uh, or, hey, you wanna go for a coffee run? I'm sort of the known for my coffee runs uh, at our agency. But, um, but then other times it's important to accelerate and there's not time for that. And the work is seasonal. And uh, I, I'm wondering, not along on the screen, if you have had trainees who kind of are just one speed, Either they're really like slow and methodical with everything or like intense and fast with everything and aren't able to upshift and downshift. So that's a skill that, uh, that, that we're suggesting is gonna be important in this new era of uh, prep in the profession of psychology. Another is rolling with change. Uh, we see that's called resilience on the PowerPoint here, but uh, you know, constant change is just, well, it's, it's part of, the place I work, I imagine it is where you work too. Um, and, uh, you know, helping interns identify, you know, what do they need to do to take care of themselves? And we specifically address this in interviews, because when we're interviewing interns, we're, we're seeking interns who uh, can be flexible and adaptive and manage shifts in policy or procedure without a whole lot of overwhelm. Um, and, and, and so we want uh, them to have the ability to cope and be resilient. And, and, um, and that's part of our assessment of whether they'd be a good fit at Texas A&M or not. So uh, in this new era uh, where there's so much change and certainly over the last year, our staff members who, who aren't comfortable with change, uh, many of them actually have left or retired. Um, uh, and, and so uh, that, I think that just to, uh, is so key in this new era, but it's never been more apt than over the last year where we've all faced a tremendous pressure to pivot and do things we don't normally do, get out of our comfort zone. The last thing I'll, I'll just say here for a second is oftentimes we're in kind of a consulting role now with interns about you know their futures or any trainees, practicum counselors about um, you know what 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 might be the best fit for them. I, I started this whole blurb by saying, you know, are we insulating interns or trainees from the realities of the job. And, and I think this is something we can do through conversation is just talk about the pros and cons of the different settings. You know, many of the trainees that come through Texas A&M, they, they're thinking, you know, do I wanna to go to a university counseling center for my career? Do I wanna work in private practice? Or um, do, do I wanna maybe get into a faculty role or some sort of hybrid of these. And, and I love just sitting down and talking to them about like the pros and cons of all these and their unique values and their culture and what's, in, you know, so, so that, that's a role that I think is just has become increasingly important uh, over the last decade or so as so many more options just have, have emerged for, for our trainings.
You're on mute, Kelly. Sorry. Jason and Jen and I all come from different settings now. I, I was in a conference center, but now I'm at a digital health company. And Jenna has been at a large hospital um, and <clears throat> academic medical center. And so I think these trends um, show up in different ways in the different settings that we're in. So we'll kind of speak to them and what they look, might look like at different types of clinics. Um, but kind of coming off of what Jason, what was, what Jason was just saying, telehealth is something we would have talked about a year ago, but um, we all have a completely different context for thinking about telehealth um, and service delivery in that modality now. And um, to be frank, one of the reasons I made the shift that I did in terms of my own career and coming over to Ginger is that it was clear to me that this isn't going to go away. And it's also clear to me that digital health and digital health care is a, a very rapidly growing industry and a place where many, many trainees can get jobs as psychologists. That um, for those who can be kind of creative in the way that they're thinking, who like the, delivering services in this modality, there are many opportunities to do pretty new and kind of revolutionary things in this field. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, at uh, CU, we were using workshops that Jason will talk about more in a minute um, to kind of supplement treatment. Like we couldn't see everybody for therapy and we had to be really creative about how do we provide some additional services that are maybe lower lift, that don't require um, as much staff time as individual therapy does. So now we do, um, in, in this new kind of platform that I'm working on, we do a lot of classes that then are available and they're recorded and available to our clients to utilize at any point. And so they kind of live on um, forever. Behavioral health coaching is something that is now becoming really commonplace in the mental health field and not that necessarily um, our trainees always want to become behavioral health coaches. That's probably more highly skilled than they than that job requires, but it's something that's important for them to know about and to know how to work with coaches in a way that can actually supplement their work and help them to make the treatment that they're providing more efficient and more effective. Um, so as we're gonna talk about in a minute, we all probably are experiencing having far more demand for our services than we have the resources or the staff or the people to provide. And so um, utilizing kind of these new <clears throat> treatment modalities, other um, ways of providing services is really important in terms of helping serve and support as many people as we possibly can um, with their mental health needs. Another thing that we, when I was at CU, we're doing a lot of, um, we're single session, instead of thinking about someone coming in and we're gonna sign them up for therapy or an ongoing course of treatment, maybe what they need is, um, kind of some one-off sessions where we are really solution focused, working on solving some problems in the moment, coming up with a really clear plan. And then they can come back in as needed, um, but to kind of relieve some of the load on our system, we're not gonna necessarily consider them an ongoing therapy client. Many of you are probably also using apps and technology in, in new ways. And this was happening pre-pandemic um, and pre the rise of telehealth, but, um, when I was at CU, we were using a lot of virtual reality therapy, actually, that kind of got put on hold during um, the time everyone's been remote, but um, that was something we were using to supplement, especially for people who maybe had anxiety, uh, phobias. Apps, of course, are really common. I think many people use them now to supplement treatment, but um, thinking in creative ways, but how can we use the technology that exists to, uh, um, make treatment more effective. And I think trainees often come in and maybe they haven't been trained in this, but they are really primed to do this well because they have adopted technology faster than many of their supervisors have. And so not only can we train them, but we can also utilize their knowledge and expertise in helping guide maybe some of the, the ways we're developing treatment programs um, in our clinics. Outcomes. Outcomes are another huge thing in our field now. I'm sure everyone has felt the pressure to provide evidence to the powers that be, whether those be vice chancellors at a university, insurance companies, to show that the, the work that we're doing is effective. Um, something we did a lot of at CU and at Ginger, it's a huge part of our treatment model. Um, we operate from a measurement-based care perspective, and so it really is in the best interest of trainees 
to learn how to use assessment instruments as part of treatment and incorporate them into conversations with their clients, talk about how, how are we evaluating treatment as it's happening. I think one of the things that we didn't do a good job of at CU that I've really been working on in my new role is helping trainees also understand what, what assessment tools are available to them. There are many instruments out there, tools that they can use to help assess outcomes in treatment. Um, and I think this is kind of where things are going in the future and to help them be successful in their careers is a really important piece of the training experience to start to incorporate more intentionally. Um, triage and scope of care. Again, back to the point that I'm sure we are all experiencing far more demand than we can, can really manage. Um, so thinking about that in the future, you know, oftentimes I think trainees kind of, someone does that sometimes on the front end for them, they have conversations, they screen clients, and then they end up on a trainee's caseload. But I think it would really behoove them to have very strong um, assessment skills in terms of diagnostic assessment, being able to quickly assess if someone is an appropriate fit for whatever setting they're in and being really able to talk with clients very clearly and candidly about what, what to expect from the treatment process wherever they are. That it's not necessarily you come on board and we see you for as long as you want to be seen, but really here's how we're gonna evaluate if you're making progress, here is what's gonna happen if at some point you may need a higher level of care than we're able to provide, or at some point you've really met your treatment goals and we're gonna you know, scale you down to a lower level of care or talk about maybe transitioning to some other kind of um, mental health support other than potentially therapy or whatever service um, they may be getting at that moment. Um, and then brief treatment, again, kind of goes hand in hand with triage and scope of care, but I think what I've seen across many, many agencies now is moving to really thinking about treatment being um, shorter and shorter to preserve resources and thinking about really providing um, care to those who most need it and thinking about other ways to support, to support those who maybe the need is less. So um, I think one of the things, especially in the Calvin Center world where we used to do a lot of long-term work, um, is helping trainees get more efficient in the care that they're providing and, and be very intentional with every session that they have. Not to say that, you know, we've all been in a situation where um, treatment kind of goes in a different direction than you maybe initially expected it to, but where they can be con consistently um, evaluated and, and being really thoughtful about um, what they're providing to their clients. Yeah, just to add to what you said about brief treatment, I, I think sometimes brief treatment gets kind of a bad reputation. Um, but for, you know, money and time constraints, uh, oftentimes clinicians and certainly clients prefer a brief treatment model. Um, and I, I'm just going to go on record of saying I kind of reject the notion that that all brief therapy um, is shallow or lacks power or depth. I don't think that has to be the case at all. And I mean, I, I certainly acknowledge there's situations where, um, you know, people, uh, longer term therapy is warranted with personality disorders and complex trauma and such. Um, and a challenge for, for this new era is to sort out the, the, those individuals who need a longer term intervention and, and connect them with those resources. Um, I, what I tell our trainees is that you can do some longer term therapy. You just can't do that with everybody. And, you know, if I see you, you know, you're at 15 sessions with the vast majority of your clients, like what, what's going on there? Like that, that's just, you're not going to keep your head above water with that. And it's just, it goes back to that ability to upshift and downshift. Now, now pruning training programming here on the PowerPoint, what, what we're getting at with this is that, you know, people are busy um, and, and uh, we have to make stuff count in this new era when it comes to our training programming. And, and, and so we found ourselves cutting seminars where the content uh, should have been covered in graduate school, in graduate programs. Uh, and, and we're loading seminars into some of the slower parts of the year, some of the holiday breaks in May and summertime. And, and, and we just can't get away with fluff anymore. Uh, we want to make sure all of our program and is, is counting and, and is, is really important and unnecessary meetings have to go. Uh, we're all just too busy and, we, and efficiency is just more crucial than, than ever before. Um, workshops. Uh, I got to be honest with you all, this isn't my strong suit. Um, you know, th there's certainly opportunities for uh, students at Texas A&M to come 
uh, be a part of workshops that we offer. And, and many students want this. Um, it's just not really the way I think, to be honest with you. Um, and I, 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 I struggle to get past thinking that this is a lesser alternative to therapy. And, but again, I got to get out of this one size fits all sort of way of thinking. And, and I got to get out of this idea that everybody wants or needs individual therapy. And, and so um, part of it probably is that I kind of come from a family where uh, that was psychologically minded. And so I had a lot of access to information about mental health and wellness, but a lot of folks don't. And so just hearing information in a workshop setting about mental health and wellness can be exactly what's needed for, uh, for many hurting people. All right, outreach. Uh, this has dr dramatically increased in emphasis at Texas A&M over the last few years. We want to be meeting students where they're at. We want to be visible. We want to focus on prevention and, and helping students overcome mental health concerns before they even get to the counseling center. We want to create, a, a, at least start to create a climate where students are helping each other and, and, and talking to each other openly and honestly about how they're not always okay. And, uh, and then maybe they can help each other and, and, and then maybe less of them will come to our counseling center uh, because they're getting support from one another. Uh, that may be idealistic, but that, that's what we're, we're hoping for. Um, messaging, we found that messaging around outreach is really key. Um, outreach is not a sideshow anymore. Uh, I think 10 years ago when I first joined the team at Texas A&M, it was very much a sideshow. I think you were like supposed to do six per year or eight per year and nobody really counted or knew. Um, and, and now it's, it's part of the heart and soul of our agency. Um, and, and there's so much great uh, potential for intern involvement in that. Uh, there's so many different kinds of outreaches. And I find myself working with interns and, and saying, what kind of outreaches are, are fitting with who you are? Do you like public speaking? Do you like going out and responding to crisis situations that are unfolding in, in the campus community? Um, and, and so I, I give them the opportunity also to, to work with one another and pair up and, and do stuff like that. Um, and it's fun. It gets them out of the office. Sometimes I'll, I'll pair up with a, a trainee and, and it'd be like a little field trip. We're going to go speak to this group across campus. And uh, so that, that's been meaningful. Jenna, I think you're up. So um, just a final few thoughts to think about. Um, so consultation is a really important skill for psychologists to have. Um, it might be instrumental for our survival as we move forward. So consultation and multidisciplinary teams is really important. But if you think about the mental health crisis um, that, you know, like we've been in for a long time, we need more mental health providers. And unfortunately, that gap is not going to be filled by psychologists. We just, our education, mm -hmm. it takes too long. We're not going to be able to produce in mass numbers. It will be filled by MSWs and LPCs. Um, and so the unique role that psychologists have to not let ourselves just be replaced is to offer consultation and run consultation groups for master level clinicians. So this is something that we've started to do in our um, agency. I think it's a lot of times we try to protect our trainees from like the realities of the organization or the realities of the job that is not protecting them. We need to prepare them and say, look, psychologists are being replaced by cheaper people who have less education. <laughs> Um, and we need to convince people who don't understand the differences in our training that we're still valuable and we're necessary for quality delivery of services. So teaching your students that where things are trending and how you can, when you go into an organization, advocate for psychologist role is like so important and should be part of internship training. So thinking about um, giving them skills to run a consultation group um, or in a specialty area where they are helping a psychologist facilitate um, case conferences with master level clinicians, such an important skill. Um, final thing I'll just talk about on this slide is integrated care. Um, that's also where the field is going. So more and more, we're going to be in medical settings. Um, obviously, I am housed in a hospital, so that is just part of our everyday life. Um, I know that there are other ways that you can integrate and partner if you're not in primarily in a medical setting to do integrated care. Um, so thinking about how can you have experiential components of your internship? So trainees can you even just get a shadowing opportunity of working in a medical setting in an integrated way. 
or having didactics about this. So what are integrated um, care models? You know, there are co-located models versus integration models. Um, what's the difference between billing for psychotherapy versus a health and behavior code? And helping trainees know that there's this whole other part of, of um, psychological services that are being delivered in a medical way um, is such an important part. And for some of us, that's just in the lifeblood of what we do. But for those it's not, that's going to be where a majority of jobs are going to be available and how psycho um, psychological services will expand over the next 10 years. So we need to prepare trainees for that. Yeah, and I would just jump in and add, coming from like, you know, the digital health world now, I would second everything Jenna said, like we work in a very multidisciplinary way, just maybe different than you, what you'd see in a hospital. So helping trainees understand how to work with other types of mental health providers, um, for us at psychiatry and um, behavioral health coaches is critical. And also, I would also second that, you know, therapists are kind of like, you can hire a master's level clinician much, much more cost effectively. And so where psychologists can be really useful is using those skills they have in assessment, um, research methods to actually go into, you know, different types of agencies or clinics and have more of a high level kind of administrative role. That's another place where I think there's going to be a lot of growth, or at least that's what I'm seeing in the world that I live in now. And I think helping um, train, helping them think about the skill sets that they already have from graduate school and how those could be applied in new ways is going to be really important um, for their career success. Okay. I know we're getting close on time. And one more note on, yeah, we are. Uh, one more <laughs> quick note on integrated care. We, we have LPCs and psychologists embedded in different parts of the university community. So we have therapists embedded in the health center. We have therapists embedded in the College of Engineering. We have therapists in athletics and the Corps of Cadets and the vet school and multicultural services. And so we have these tentacles out there. And I, I love this because it helps us to be visible. That's so, that's so key when it comes to university counseling. And, and it also helps with, uh, with us seeing the bigger picture and not just myopic, myopically looking at our own you know, world. Um, and, and it's great for intern involvement, especially helping trainees see the bigger picture. Okay. Keeping staff excited about training. This this is this is so key, especially when staff are, are weary and tired. And um, first point here, counting uh, supervision as clinical time, or what we call it at our agency, is direct service. Uh, there's an expectation that our staff have to have a certain number of direct service hours out of their 40 hours in the week. And and uh, if they if we're not counting supervision as direct service, otherwise it's just kind of extra work on top of the work they're already doing. And, uh, and that, that can take the, the wind out of the sails. The, the second point here, creating opportunities to share expertise or passion. People love that, right? People love to be appreciated or even just seen for what they bring to the table and the wisdom that they've accumulated over the, their careers. And um, you know, I, 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 try to, I try to highlight that um, and to, to kind of bring uh, enthusiasm in our training program and, and circle back to the, the people on our staff who, who provide seminars or supervision to our trainees and say, you know, they, the, the, the interns ate that up or that, you know, that was so important for our interns to hear and just kind of reinforce that, uh, that what they're bringing to the table really matters. Yeah. Along those lines, you know, the more you can foster a sense of belonging, feeling like they fit, that there's some sort of team around doing training, which for the most part, it's really fun, but we've all been in that place where sometimes it's really hard. You might have a supervisee who there are some challenges. Um, and I think the more that you can create some unity around that, the more buy-in um, you get from supervisors and other folks who are involved in training. And similarly, you know, I think a lot of people may be in agencies where at times you, you don't feel empowered or it feels like a lot of decisions are being made around you and you're having to constantly adapt to um, a changing game and helping utilize the training experiences place, a place where they can be empowered, um, I think can be really helpful and being creative, bringing these new ideas to the table um, and creating that space within the training context can be really useful. You know, and then um, I think one really important thing I'm um, going to jump down to the very bottom here is, 
utilizing supervisor development plans. And so, you know, for our interns, we develop those individualized learning plans. So one of the things that we've started to do at our site is whenever we have a new supervisor, uh, meeting with them and developing a supervisor development plan. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's really helpful about this is, first of all, identifying kind of what is your experience with supervision and where do you want to see yourself grow? Um, and also thinking strategically of like in five or 10 years, how do you want to see your involvement in training um, change, mature, um, and, and where do you want it to go? And, and for some people, it's just, I, I kind of want to be a supervisor. And for others, they have a mission to be a training director. So there's a really cool um, opportunity to, to um, match their desires. And so once you have their goals, you can really um, match training experiences to optimize their, their goals. And then it's not like you're just doing training every year. It's they're actually growing and they're building in terms of what they're doing. Um, I have found that this lets me... Um, really meet supervisors where they're at, and it grows chances for informal leadership. And so for those supervisors who want to grow in their leadership or be more involved in training leadership, um, being able to help them give them um, the didactic series and say, I want you to shape this, form this, do something innovative with this and give them complete control. Or I want you to um, create a DEI subgroup that's going to focus on our recruitment for the year and hand that over to them. Um, it's good to know that though, because the last thing you want to do is go to a supervisor and say, hey, will you do this thing? And they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you asked me to do this thing. Um, <laughs> versus, oh, I'm so excited to do this thing. And having that initial conversation of like, what are their goals in terms of their development? will feel like those assignments are not extra work, but they're purposeful and they're matched to what your supervisor needs. Um, and then finally, just messaging appreciation all of the time. Um, one of the things I found to be really helpful, we get a large number of applications um, that our supervisors have to review and it takes several hours. And so I have begun to write letters. Um, I have a standard format that basically says, this is how many applications, this is how many hours it took this person, this is a letter of recognition. Um, my supervisors then can use it on their end of year um, evaluations to show um, what they've done for excellence in training, um, or those who are going up for promotion use those letters as evidence. So thinking about small ways that don't cost money, that you can take just a little bit of time and write letters of recognition that can actually impact people's raises um, or other career opportunities for growth. All right, should we hit the, I have great news for all of you. It's our last slide. <laughs> I know this has been compelling and also Friday uh, evening is just right around the corner. So <laughs> um, because you've all been so excellent, I'm going to um, reward you with a fun anecdote that hopefully you'll enjoy. So <laughs> breaks up the end of the presentation. So I have a couple of friends and um, just stay with me, but they, uh, they bought a truck and they're pretty excited because they thought, oh, this will be a cool way to make a little side money and do a little side hustle. And so this is back when I lived um, out in a farming area. And so they decided uh, they were gonna drive out to um, a farmer in the area who grew watermelons. They're gonna buy the watermelons for a dollar a piece. They're gonna go out to the county road and sell them. So they did this, they bought the watermelons for a dollar a piece, went out to county line road um, and sold the watermelons for a dollar a piece. So they start doing this, um, do it for about a week and they're like, oh my gosh, we're not making any money. Like, this is terrible. And so they sit down and they, we need to do something. Um, what should we do? So they think and think and think. And my one friend says, the, uh, the other friend, I've got it. We need to buy a bigger truck. <laughs> yeah, it's a terrible story. I acknowledge that. Okay, it's a terrible story. Um, but it has a profound um, conclusion. Most of us, um, when we are faced with a problem, when something is not working, we solve that problem by doing more. I just need to do more of this thing. Um, and boy, does self-care fall under that. <laughs> so I'm doing all this stuff, so I need to do some more stuff to take care of myself. Um, and really, self-care does not help uh, if it's doing more. And the solution to the watermelon story is obviously it's not to buy a bigger truck, it's to change the price. And so what we want to do is start reconceptualizing, and rather than doing more for self-care, we want to do different. That's a really important thing. So we have to really think about how do we balance trainees' needs. So looking at their schedules and thinking about what are optimal ways to like schedule patients and when do we actually give them writing time? I mean, I realized that I was scheduling a bunch of patients on Friday afternoon and then my trainees didn't even have writing time until Tuesday morning. Um, that's a stressful thing for trainees because now they're gonna have to do work on the weekends to make sure the notes are on time. So um, I have learned over time every year or two to do a time audit and sit down with interns and ask what worked or didn't about their schedule. Um, we can't just give a self-care didactic and say that's enough. Um, so putting kind of the investment into this is critical. So for example, we, we now on a quarterly basis, we cancel a whole um, day of didactic learning, and that is a self-care professional development day. 
and it's just left for those things. So it's not an addition to, it's a, we took something away from, um, because we have bought into the value that self-care cannot be an extracurricular. We cannot ask trainees to do it on top of. We have to build it into. So I think that's a really important part of it. Um, also, it is modeling. I try not to like send, uh, I try not to check my emails after five. Never have looked at my emails after five and been like super glad I opened that email, um, like ever. <laughs> So I, I try to encourage my trainees where possible, um, you know, when they're not on call to, to not be engaged in work, but you have to model that and you have to ask your supervisors to model that. And if I have a supervisor who likes to work at 11 at night and that's their value, super cool, draft that email and send it first thing in the, mar in the morning. Don't send that email at 11 p.m. and socialize in terms of that's okay. Um, so I think those are important conversations to have. And um, we have to think about how we promote these things. Um, and for me, I've really moved away from self-care to professional longevity. And I've encouraged interns to think about how much sleep are you getting? And if you're not getting adequate sleep, what is getting in the way of that? And how do we support you to have better sleep habits? How are you doing in terms of your nutrition? Um, just basic needs. When are you, when are you like clocked off, logged out, not doing work stuff? And what are ways that you are doing engagement to fill your tank? Um, because those are habits that are needed for professional longevity. And if you don't have them, you're not going to have them all of a sudden when you start as an early career psychologist. Um, and really emphasizing the kind of intern and postdoc you are is the kind of early career psychologist you are. So giving them permission with that power dynamic to be able to set some boundaries and think about some of those healthy behaviors and getting your committee to buy into that is, I think, pretty essential. Um, so remember, tell a watermelon story. It's terrible, but it's got a great point to it. Don't ask trainees to do more. Ask your program to do different. I love that, Jenna, because I used to always say, if I can just get to here, then I'll live in more healthy ways. Like if I can just propose my dissertation or pass comps or defend my dissertation or match with internship or get a job or pass the EPPP, it was always like this next hurdle, then I'll, then I'll engage in self-care, professional longevity, and it's just a mirage. Yeah, I think, and I appreciate that, Jason. One last thing I'll say with this, and um, Kinley, I think you have something to add, uh, is that um, trainees have been, what they've done in graduate school, and we need to raise their awareness to say yes, yes, yes. And that works when you have seasonal work um, and when it ends. And um, when you start as an early career psychologist, that's the fastest way to burn out is to say yes, 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 yes. Because the semester is not going to end. The projects and the committees aren't going to get over. Um, and so what made them successful in graduate school does not make them successful as early career psychologists. And internship and postdoc is the time to re-socialize them to set them up for success. Yeah. Good. yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, John. And, and I think, you know, as high achieving people, we are we're rewarded by saying yes, right? Like it feels good to be successful and take on another thing. And so helping them reframe and think about like, you have a very long career ahead of you. You have many, many more years in your career than you did as a graduate student. And how are you gonna, my training director on internship used to say, pace the fun. So how are you gonna pace the fun over the next 30 years of your career rather than like, you know, burning yourself out right out of the gate? So um, on that note, we did it. We got through, um, <laughs> go us. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can actually see people because it's really disorienting to me <laughs> to not be able to see the group very well, but I can bring this back up if needed. Okay. Um, and I think at this point we can open it up for questions. I'm just gonna check the chat and see if anything came through there. But feel free y'all to either put it in the chat or just unmute and let us know what questions you have. So in related to the um, last slide, I decided um, something I plan to do differently this year um, during orientation. Um, I call it sustainable wellness. Um, we are professional longevity. And uh, the very first thing we're talking about during orientation is wellness. Normally I go through this, the whole handbook. We're talking about all this like dry information to get you oriented to the site. And I decided, you know, I'm gonna just turn the whole thing around this year, start with wellness start with a casual lunch where everybody's sitting around and talking and doing some cultural sharing and some introductions and like just set the frame for the whole year. Fingers crossed y'all, I hope this works. Um, <laughs> it's totally different, but um, that's kind of how I've tried to hopefully get the, um, not only trainees, but the faculty excited about starting a new year. Love it, that's awesome. 
Okay, say that term one more time because that's that's a great term. I want to make sure everybody encoded that. I haven't, um, you know, submitted a paper on that yet, so you can't take my term. Okay. Yet. Yeah, no, sustainable wellness. It's my what I like love to call. That. <laughs> love it. I haven't I'm coined professional longevity yet either. <laughs> we'll be sure to credit you both when we use them. I really appreciated hearing about all of the different um, forums in which you presented this in such a comprehensive and kind of packageable way. Like I, you know, I found myself thinking, oh, we do that. We need to do more of that. And so, so thank you so much for um, condensing it and, and kind of presenting it in one, one place. I look forward to having the slides. And something I've been reflecting on, um, I read some of uh, Johnson's work on communitarian approaches to counseling and how it needs to really change how we think about the work that we do. Just thinking about this culture of care and that's something from, from those articles. So um, you know, there's a lot of care that we provide to the trainees, there's care we're providing to the staff, there's care we're trying to provide to ourselves. And so and that's what we do for our, our clients, our patients as well. So um, I've just been reflecting on that. You know, how are we taking care of all of the steps here? And which what does require a lot of time and energy. And, and that can also require a lot of depletion as well. So I appreciate being reminded of how to um, cultivate all of that care throughout our institutions, but also for ourselves. Um, and really appreciate the integration, um, Jenna, of a lot of your, your ideas and um, just the boldness with that. I think that it really does require a paradigm shift for our institutions. There's um, something that came up in the chat there. Uh, okay, a question. Wondering how to support minority interns who usually work with a more complex and intersection population uh, and in other languages. This is a this is a great question. Um, a couple of things come to, to mind, and then um, I'll also let Kelly and Jason uh, contribute if they have other things. Um, I think it's really important, first of all, just to acknowledge that this happens, um, and to have discussions with our trainees and with our supervisors about the minority tax, um, and that often we are asking more of our minority trainees and our early career psychologists who are minorities um, to represent and that they're encumbered with more service demands and with higher clinical demands. So first of all, I think raising awareness that this happens um, broadly in an institution and among the training program is the first thing to socialize people with. Um, the second thing that I think is important is needing to balance um, activities and maybe changing loads um, or requirements for trainees who have this. Um, so for example, we offer Spanish supervision for our bilingual Spanish speaking trainees but we asked them to do an extra hour of supervision to have that. Um, and so when we originally started, it's like, oh, here's this great thing, but it's like, yeah, I'm actually asking you to do more work than all the other trainees to provide more services. And now your caseload is customized in a different way. So um, we had conversations with trainees now about how do we wanna flex your requirements? We don't wanna take any opportunities away from you, but what would feel fair and equitable? Um, knowing that you're being asked to do a different level of work. Um, so I think those are kind of the two recommendations that um, I would offer is the education and then um, modifying schedules to accommodate for extra demand that is placed on trainees um, who are minorities and are dealing with this stuff. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say is that, you know, we tend to think or maybe we don't, but like people in the administration often think a clinical, all clinical hours are equal and they're not. <laughs> Some clinical hours are much more difficult clinical hours than others. And so, especially as training directors, I think being an advocate for, like Jenna is saying, that, that some schedules need to look different and that that, that is the right thing to do. Um, I think that requires us to really um, step up and be the voice of that for, you know, and some systems it's probably easier to do than others, but just acknowledging that the, that the work is not all the same. In my observations, what often happens is that 
um, uh, leaders, administrators will uh, see and notice and, and comment on this tax that Jenna was mentioning. And some don't even do that, but it was an off, you know, at, at my agency, they often do. Um, and then it's easy to pat oneself on the back. Like, hey, I, I, I made this person feel seen. But to Jenna's second point about needing to then make some sort of modification. Um, if, if you just see somebody struggling and don't do anything about it, it's almost patronizing, right? And, and, and so uh, I think I love Jenna's second point about acting on it and, and having some flex schedule or adjustment uh, that is made. I, I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate your the presentation. I think this was very well put together and um, it, a lot to reflect on. And, and I'm gonna throw out maybe two other terms and some trainings that we've done in our center um, that I think are relevant to this self-care. You know, one was um, some research about compassion fatigue um, and, and how that impacts, again, the work that we do. I think, I th I think people even our, on our campus don't really understand you know, maybe faculty who don't really understand the work we're doing when we're helping students work through suicidal ideation or keeping them safe and that, and yes, that's stressful and that's our job, but it, it can impact us. And if we don't have a way to um, unload or, or do the self-care that helps us, sometimes we need to connect with a colleague and, and trainees are doing this as well. I think that it, it, it's really important to, uh, again, the work that we're doing and, and protecting ourselves and keeping ourselves well and, and healthy to do the work. And another a training we did this year was on emotional labor. And this one actually made me think about it differently. You know, uh, I think of myself as a good neighbor, um, but when neighbors come up to me and say, hey, Matt, I've got a 12 year old kid who's struggling with some anxiety. I thought I'd just pick your brain. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I thought I was just being a good neighbor and I was willing to offer maybe my thoughts and insights, but that's emotional labor. And, and as these presenters talked about, I get paid a lot of money to do what I do in my professional training to, to do that. And when I'm doing that extra stuff, that also kind of takes, um, it, it just takes a little bit out of me. It's just more on my plate. And I've got a lot on my plate as a training director and all these other responsibilities. So, so in our office, yes, definitely with trainees and with staff, we're, we're always looking at these different pieces of how we can help each other and support each other through the challenging work that we do um, and, and how, how we can kind of stay well. And I think that's very important. Thanks, Matt, I appreciate you sharing. And good to see you. <laughs> we have another question in the chat. Um, I wanna thank you for the actionable steps and strategies. The question is how do you make time to work on these initiatives with other responsibilities? I can start and take a stab at it and feel free, Jenna and Jason, jump in. Um, I'm, I'm reading this as, uh, like as a training director, how do you make time? And then how do you make time maybe within the system because it's gonna take time out of other people's schedules as well. And I think um, <laughs> it's so easy. My, I'm like in what Jenna was saying, like my tendency is to just do more, right? Like I'm like the person with the watermelons in the truck and I'm making no money. Um, so I think it's, you know, advocating for ourselves, having conversations with whoever our supervisors are around why these things are important and what realistically that's going to mean in terms of the time commitment. Um, and knowing that a lot of this stuff like doesn't just happen overnight. Like it's really about thinking long term and starting to put plans into place, like thinking beyond just the next month, two month, even training year and having kind of longer term goals, or at least that's how I do it. Um, in terms of where I want to go, because it's so easy to kind of get up in the caught up in the day to day grind and just feel like you're kind of just putting out fires and trying to get through the end of the day or the end of the week. But really taking a minute to step back and thinking about how kind of what do I want things to look like six months from now, a year from now, um, and what like logistically would that look like to actually put that into place. I was going to say we do this at 11 o'clock at night. I'm just kidding. Um, no, I, I, I would say more honestly, the, the downtimes, um, summer and in between semesters. And, but my, my, what I want to emphasize in this is I think a lot of the things that you heard today fall into the category of working smart, not hard. And I think some of these things when implemented uh, can make the 
role easier for trainers like us, as well as for trainees. And I know there's been um, stuff going around on the APIC listserv and, and APIC scouted information. I do think it's important to advocate for adequate time for training directors. Um, I'm very grateful that I have a 0.5 and I have an administrative um, coordinator um, full time. I don't know if I had less than that, how I could do these things. So first of all, I'll acknowledge that um, we don't have equity across training directors, right? So some of us are able to do a lot more because of that. Um, and we are more resourced and that would be an interesting discussion in and of itself of, of how that works. Um, the second thing I have found helpful is making fast decisions um, and then coming coming back to those things. So um, in our training meeting, we use jam boards a lot on Google where I pose a question and everybody posts stickies of like, this is what we're going to do um, and gathering those and being like, okay, here we're going next. Um, the majority of our training meetings, we meet monthly, they're working meetings. So we usually start with a concept. Um, we go into breakout rooms and then we have a product that's developed by the end or action step. So to, towards working smart, I think optimizing your training committee and existing meetings that they're always working meetings and that you have a goal to start and that you have an actual item that you finish with. Um, I mean, we wrote our DEI um, commitment statement during one of our working meetings and then we had a month to review it. Um, but if I had to do that by myself, that probably would have taken hours. Um, is it the best DEI statement ever? No, but we have one um, and it's something that we can revise. So I think those are the important things. And Jenna, to your earlier point that how do you enlist the support, which is what you're talking about, but how do you enlist the support of staff? I think there's always some gems and um, staff that are willing to, to grow in their pro own professional development. So how do we foster that as well? Because staff do have great ideas. Thank you. One of you um, alluded to this um, during the presentation, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to this idea of being middle managers as training directors and being sort of squeezed from both um, from both ends with the institutional or the organizational departmental demands for productivity, for direct service, for more RVUs. Um, and I'm not just talking about the RVUs that are expected of the trainees, but more of the supervisors and the commitment that it takes to really do good supervision um, and how much time that would involve. Um, you know, our institutions sort of took away all of our um, supervision time. And so as much as I would like for people to have that taken out, that's not really an option. Yeah, it, it was me that made that reference earlier and just acknowledging the fact that as trainers, we're often pulled in different directions, uh, many times by the people above us who have expectations and then uh, trainees often pull on us for different things. And, and sometimes trainees don't see the bigger picture um, and, and see themselves as a bigger part or a, a small part of something bigger, the, the, the counseling center or the division of student affairs in our situation. And so it, it's, it's, it's hard to navigate all that. And my point earlier was that sometimes it's okay to just um, listen and validate and say, you know, that what you shared with me is important and I'm going to think about that. And one of the things that's also helped me is to, to then, when I'm coming to my own opinions or conclusions, to take those to the, we have a training committee, uh, and um, I've intentionally crafted or, or assembled a training committee that they're not people, you know, just like me, they don't always think like me, they're people that have the ego strength to tell me my ideas are stupid, and I need that, right, because i uh, I, I'm ignorant sometimes. I'm I'm, I'm culturally bound and uh, as a white male, and and and, and so um, I I oftentimes don't make decisions until I am able to, you know, bat that around with the the training committee. Thank you, Jason. We are um, at time exactly. And so we want to thank you again, Kenley, Jenna, and Jason for presenting to us today and um, for all of the participants who attended. So reminder that we will be sending out an email to all registered participants. Please complete the evaluation. We value your feedback 
and uh, you'll receive your certificate of attendance. And so thank you again, everyone. Really appreciate